Cheers, everybody, and welcome to another episode of your favorite late Friday night hash cast variables. I am one of your hosts, Frigoroli, aka how do you pronounce that? And we've also got Pedro, aka Mr. Rosin's neighborhood, and of course, Superior Buds, aka Superior Buds 420. Tonight, we'd like to welcome our special guest, one of my good friends uh first online and then in real life a another panelist with me on the michigan bros grow show um and one of my favorite and most respected flower growers here in michigan uh he is a craft cannabis caregiver uh, takes much pride in that he has worked in the commercial industry he's worked for himself with other people for other people um clearly as you see, a fan of Michigan, local to, well, we'll get to that, but uh, Red Center Farm. Cheers, man. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, you guys can find us streaming live on YouTube, Twitch, X, and then, of course, after the show, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for joining us, man. Thank Cheers, you. Man. Welcome. That fantastic intro. Cheers, Red. Appreciate you. Cheers, What's guys. Cheers, dude. Uh, this is some flow. Okay. Uh, this is, it would be uh, an <clears throat> Afghani and a purple tie blend that DJ Short bred many, many years ago. He then did some work with Dutch Passion. Dutch Passion dropped some seeds of flow with his work. There was some back and forth between their relationship. I don't believe they work together anymore. Um, long story short, this is not DJ Short's flow. Uh, as of recent, this would be the, I believe, the Dutch Passion version, which would be flow of yesteryear. So, smoking on some good old old school throwback. Um, oh, yeah. nice. You know, the controversy aside, this is great weed. You know, I don't care who bred it. Originally, DJ Short bred it, so shout out to him, most importantly, for all of his work that he's done over the years. I'm certainly a fan of his work, uh, the Blueberry and coincidentally, it's through one of his seminars that brings me onto the interwebs uh, with meeting old man Hermit Hash as at one of his seminars and then being brought into the Mission Bros Grow Show space uh, back in like 2019, I believe, back not long after the show began. So it was really cool. So, so you've you've already dropped some some knowledge on us with these the lineage and stuff. Those are things I can never keep track of, and I don't pop enough seeds to probably need to track. Uh, but uh, speaking of breeders, you talk about DJ Short and some others. Do you have a particular favorite breeder at the moment? Not not so much at the moment. I do have a, a handful of, I guess, just from like what I've had experience with working with, uh, Archive being one of them. Uh, Fletcher with Archive has done a great job holding on to really good, also like kind of throwback genetics, not so much uh, working into the bottleneck pool, if you will, like uh, the similar, like, you know, everything kind of in the line of the cookies run. He kind of goes off of that and works with uh, some some other older strains, which is more of a uh, burnt rubber, gassy, you know, some older like sativa note type plants, uh, skunks and things like that. I see Daddy Red in chat. Shout out to uh, my dad in there. He's he's always he's always poking around. It's good to see him in there. Cheers, Daddy Red. Cheers, Daddy Red. And also everybody else that I do see in chat. Uh, I don't have my phone right in front of me and. Uh, since I'll be conversating, I just want to get my cheers out of the way right now. So, actually, if uh, because we are streaming on so many different platforms right now, in fact, we're at least eight of them simultaneously streaming live. Um, I'm not sure if I think you should be able to see it here on the back end, Red. If you look at the comments tab on probably the, to the right of our video that you're looking at, that is streaming all of the comments from all of those different streams all in the one spot. So um I, th I mean you might be able to respond individually per channel and all that there as well or just in mass but uh yeah you should be able to see them all in the comment section in the stream yards program here is everybody mm -hmm. yeah it's all of them so if you guys have uh, any questions for red setter just do that at that at symbol red setter or any of us pedro ferroli superior buds we'll see it and uh, kind of highlights it for us and yeah, see it us know. if i miss it spam me I'll yeah see right <laughs> just shout red from the rooftops hey so uh can you i mean I i'm curious to know kind of how how you got your start into all of this um but for 
uh, I mean, for a lot of us, usually we don't just start growing weed. Usually that's like, you know, we're like a sly teenager or some so thereabouts and we get our hands on some delicious tree or, or, or some friends, you know, peer pressure us into it or, or I don't know, we just somehow we, we fall into this first smoke, right? Do you have a, uh, a story to share with us about your first time smoking? First time I smoked weed was by myself. Uh, it's not, I, I don't hear that story too often. Uh, the, the first time I smoked weed was, was not out of peer pressure. It was, it was, it was out of sheer curiosity. Um, That's so I, good to hear because I share the same fucking story. I you do. It. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And it was, um, you know, there was, there was a lot going on in the mid late nineties as far as the cat coming out of the bag, so to speak. Uh, California, it was it prop 215. I'm not sure what their medical, what was, whatever their medical thing that happened, um, in California in the mid nineties, 96, I believe it originally got medical. Um, there was a couple of, uh, HBO specials that I had seen where this, uh, uh, man with HIV, uh, gave a monologue and he was talking about cannabis helping his HIV. Um, I had seen many other testimonies of people with with cancer and cannabis was helping and mind you this is in the mid 90s i'm 12 to 13 years old and uh yeah yeah i guess i i was just kind of becoming one of those you know ruffian teenage kids um but to be honest i had also uh gone through the the dare program um i similar to you for girlie i had i have a medal yep yep i have one of those medals and not everybody in the class got a medal only the ones that that spoke and you know got selected from their essay got to receive a medal and the dare award so to speak only was only a couple people got the dare award in our class i got the dare award um yeah anti peer pressure I'd and now look at us red yeah yeah you know anti drug is what definitely i'm still anti peer pressure right and so i suppose that at the time of getting into smoking cannabis when it was my my turn up to bat i was curious i was curious because people were being helped by cannabis i was curious because i had drank alcohol and i had kind of felt the effects of alcohol and it was pretty miserable and i was like damn this is kind of rough people are getting helped with cannabis this is weird um so i i tried to source it you know i i had overheard some kids in class i don't know i was i was in like seventh grade i've heard some kids in class talking about smoking weed you know one kid in class had had a bag of weed and was like walking down the hallway like very foolishly like throwing it up in the air so i went to that dude i went right yeah. to that dude. i went straight to that dude and asked him to get now it. you know <laughs> and and he gets me this little thing of foil and i'll never forget this is a little thing for and i show it to my buddy i'm like hey check this out i got the shit dude you know and he and it, we break it open and we're in class and we look at it and it smells kind of fruity and it smells kind of funky he's like dude that's tobacco that's pipe tobacco i'm like no is he's the dude so the dude sold me it was it was like it was either black and mild tobacco or pipe tobacco so i think it was broken i think it was black and mild i think it was his black and mild dumped out so i'm like, I'm a little upset about that so uh i go to another dude and i tell him about the story he gifts me a sack dude a sack man like a, like a fucking sack you know a few grams and it was green and it was, and I'm telling you, this is mid to late nineties. Weed was not green around my area. I, I, I grew up on the, uh, in the Detroit suburb, the Western Detroit suburbs, just uh, from, I went to Wayne state university, downtown Detroit from my house to Wayne state is about a 15 minute drive, 15, 20 minutes of traffic. So right on the outside Detroit suburbs. And most of my life in high school, we called downtown Detroit Brown. That was just the, the, dirt brown it was brown weed man and and full of seeds and stems and for once my first sack of weed was some green weed it smelled really good i remember it had some red hairs and and i treasured this sack dude and and i like like fucking um uh the the little the little guy with my precious you know i took my little precious down to the well you know 
And uh, his name Schmeagle uh, or whatever. <laughs> Schmeagle, there it is. Schmeagle, women are Schmeagle, and, yeah. <laughs> and it smells great. And I'm written, this is weed. I'm like, this is weed right here. You know, I got a little. It's in uh it's in a cellophane, a cigarette cellophane, or something like that. And so, so the kid that gave it to me, he gives it to me. He's like, this is I, I got it from my mom. Stashed, stashed it from his or stole it from his mom's stash. Okay. So he uh, he gives it to me, gifts it to me after hearing my my like rip off story, you know, getting ripped off. And, and 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 Daddy Red, he works day shifts. Mama Red, she works day shifts. They're they're both at work, and I got like a half day at school. Cool, I get home from work at like eleven o'clock, and and I have no idea what weed is. I had smoked a cigarette or two, and I'd gotten that head head buzz from a cigarette. I drank some Surge, you know, Surge was fucking phenomenal. <laughs> Surge and my rollerblades, you know, and. And, and, and I went to town on that fucking doobie, man, and I smoked a little bit of it, and I was high all fucking day. I'll never forget that. And, and I got like, it felt good. For, I was like, huh, this is this is cool. I went around, on, 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 you know, I went for a little bike ride. I ate so much shit, dude. I ate watermelon. I ate cereal. I, I just, I remember it all. I remember the entire fucking ride. Did you cough up a lung like the first like couple? Yeah, of yeah. I mean, and, and honestly, I got high. I got really high that first time I smoked too. And I smoked because I I rolled my own doobie. I sat there and I figured out this fucking doobie, man. I had some I had some like tops papers or zigzag papers. That That's like, pretty uh, impressive. <laughs> and I sat there and I fucked around with this thing. Um, and I rolled myself a doobie. Mom and dad were both at work, and I just hit that thing a few times and. Uh, and yeah, and one of my buddies came over and I was, he was fucking with me cause I was high, you know? And, uh, and then I remember having to go help my grandmother out and move rocks, big pile, like a yard or two of rocks sitting on her fucking driveway, you know, for me and big fucking pile, moving to the backyard, you know, and I was so, I was high all fucking day moving those rocks, dude, going to have dinner with my mom and grandma. And I'm like, uh, still high. It's like six hours later. How long does this shit last, man? You know? And it, it, it kind of turned me on because I didn't feel like any of the effects from the propaganda that I was told, you know, any of that stuff. And also the next, I didn't have any kind of a hangover, nothing, not a, not a damn thing. And through months or years of getting a dime bag here, a dime bag there, trying some weed, you know, at a bowl, whatever, you know, by this time I may be, I don't know, 13, 14, I'm a young very young, uh, smoking weed. But to be honest, it was for me kind of helping. Um, I lost my, my 18 year old cousin when I was 11, I was 11. She was diagnosed with brain cancer. She had a neuroglastoma. It wasn't long. Uh, I think, I think she was diagnosed when she was 16 or 17. It was not long before the, the brain tumor had taken her life. Surgery was no longer an option. And and it wasn't long after me being 11, 12 years old that I started to hear about people with cancer being helped with cannabis. And that's really what flipped the switch for me for saying, well, why is the police officer at school telling me that cannabis is bad and there's a drug dealer in a trench coat that's going to like, you know, chop my arm off? And then there's it's always the trench coat <laughs> in, 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 in my cousin could have been saved by the canvas. So, so was, I was really young when I started to get these perplexing thought, like <clears throat> almost, almost believing in conspiracy, like what is going on, you know? And then, and then as I was a young teenager, I realized that it was conspiracy that there really was this cannabis conspiracy that cannabis was taken away from the human population. Um, uh, the emperor wears no clothes. I believe it's the Jack Herrera story. Uh, really one of the first, you know, get the story out there. Um, and so it was, it was pretty early on that I had gotten information from that. I was obviously, uh, I had the internet as a youth and, and more information was coming out and, I really started to get the itch of we've been lied to. We've been kind of backstabbed in a way. Our health has been disrupted. And the older I got and the more I learned about cannabis, I kind of got a little mad. And, you know, learning that cannabinoids have been actually taken away from us, from our livestock, uh, CBD, hemp, um, the, the 
and, and not just because we could get high from it and medicinal, but because it was a great source of fuel, fiber, uh, could replace trees, agroforestry, all, all these ecological reasons, um, uh, just uh, helping the destruction of the rainforest, et cetera. I was pretty ecologically, um, you know, environmentally friendly. I wanted to be environmentally friendly as a child. You know, it's something that I really found passion for. Uh, it was a big, big movement when I was a kid in the early 90s, like Save the Whales and, and all that stuff. Uh, I love the movie Free Willy. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Stuff like that. You know, it's just little little bits of like propaganda that might trigger little things. But, you know, in a, in a way, it was it was good. Good for me. Um, <clears throat> getting forward into getting high with cannabis, um, I started feeling that like that that kind of like depression that had taken over as a youth, losing my cousin. A couple years later, my my another cousin almost died from psychedelic mushrooms that were not psychedelic; they were poisonous. Oh, geez, poisonous mushrooms being sold to him as psychedelic mushrooms. Um, and, and so all of these kind of like, uh, uh, ways that make you, you know, not really trust, you know, certain things, you know, definitely don't trust drugs. And so I really wasn't into, I really was scared of drug use or I should say peer pressure for that matter. Um, and later on that specific instance, what really got me turned into the harm reduction side uh, polarity science, uh, that I, that I also do is a harm reduction, um, here in, in, in the Ann Arbor area, Washtenaw County, and then other parts of Michigan, we have, uh, decriminalization laws of, of psychedelics and of mushrooms and things. And so I started this polarity science, which was harm reduction. And so that basis from that, but not to digress too far, the, the overall love for the plant really came from the medicinal and just overall, uh, same as just about everybody that I talk to that, that loves cannabis, you know, it has, has so much potential and it was taken away from us. So foolishly. And, and then you learn, and then you learn the politics involved behind it. You learn that it was, you know, the logging industry and the plastic industry and the, the oil industry, and they get together and they lobby and, and 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 the and that the American Medical Association fought for cannabis to keep it legal or to keep it you know as medicine, and you learn about these things, and <clears throat> and then you learn that a lot of people are very ignorant to it, and that they just don't know about it, and that it it's not just it's not just conspiracy; it's fact. It really happened, and that's where that's where like when I was when I was growing up. People who were into cannabis, and it was kind of like it was kind of like stereotypical. It was kind of cliche, but you're smoking cannabis, you might talk about conspiracies sometimes, and so be it. I mean, it, it, the biggest conspiracy of them all was real. You know what I mean? That the cannabis was taken away from us. So yeah, I would I would ever now it's, it's kind of a side effect of the medication, right, Red? Like it, it yeah. it's it's. I mean, you can opening call it a lot of different things, but yeah, opening or expanding your mind to the possibilities of other things and just maybe questioning things a little bit more. And it, I was going to ask when the first time you did that and listening to your story, it sounds like it wasn't right off the bat. Like it wasn't like the first time you got high, but it was no, it wasn't. with that kind of, excuse my French on this, but the tree hugging side of you, right? Like that, along with that kind of came this like, all right, well, Maybe there's some propaganda here. Maybe there's some conspiracies here. And it was and just it was because it's a conspiracy doesn't mean it's not true or factual. There, there are conspiracies out there that exist. It's a conspiracy to do something, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm not saying that all conspiracies are real, but, you know, there, right. there are fun rabbit holes to get down. And I don't ever, you know, you know, obviously some of them you can go, yeah, yeah it's whatever. But then some, <laughs> but I mean, it, you know, for whatever one, some of them are fun to get down the rabbit hole on. But I mean, a lot of them we do find out like MK ultra, you know, I, I'm not going to list a whole bunch of them and start conversations. There's plenty, you know, more controversy, but yeah. in the cannabis one, we all know we're still riding that way. You know, this is yeah. still the way that we're riding. We're riding the propaganda side of things. People are still coming out with the propaganda. That's bad for you. Well, there's still a lot of people that exist on this planet that <laughs> went through 40, 50 plus years of that propaganda and are, maybe still not even really conscious of 
the culture shift, you know, and yeah. they go vote too. <laughs> right. And it, in, in, in a, I guess a long story short, all of that combined is what got me, got me into cannabis. The medicinal side of things really turned me into like wanting to narrow my, my thoughts. Now, now when I was a teenager, I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to do all these things. When I got out of high school, I went to Wayne state university and I was just taking, you know, I was going to uh, try to be a designer. I didn't really know what the fuck I wanted to do. Honestly, I was one of those, like, you know, trying to find myself teenagers, uh, I ended up dropping out of Wayne state after about a year because I just couldn't pass physics, man. Physics was just not happening. And all these pre-ed classes that I was having to take, I was just like, what the fuck, man? I'm not going to do, I don't want to do any of this. I want to work. Does suck, man. All those requisites. I, I, I really wanted to, to work with my hands. I was really artistic technically. Like I used to like work with headline. I used to make, make speaker boxes for my friends. I had small businesses working with, you know, changing out headliners and doing door panels. And I go down to the textile store here in Ips. I, I live, you know, in, in Westland and I'd come out here to Ypsilanti and get the fucking textile stores, you know, and, and pick up some shit and redo headliners with foam and do stuff like that. I wanted to work with my hands. I ended up getting my, uh, my license to fix airplanes. And because they, you could work with composites and sheet metal and they taught you all these hydraulics and pneumatics so i ended up dropping out of wayne state and doing all of that and i worked in the airline industry for a couple of years fixing valves for a manufacturing company it was actually a german manufacturing company had a shop not too far from here and i worked for them for for a couple of years until i had gotten a random drug screening and lost my lost my job to that now i wasn't a full-time grower at the time but i was growing a plant at my house i was a regular smoker i i've been a regular cannabis consumer since probably just out of high school if not maybe even my senior year of high school was kind of that like i'm gonna smoke some weed uh, don't get too far because you told us about your first smoke and i'm very curious to hear about your first plant too or your first growing yeah so so that's so that was uh kind of after i moved well my first plant was when i was 14. And that was in my bedroom window, started a seed. I was when I was in seventh grade, in I believe it was seventh grade biology. Uh, it, we learned how to germinate seeds, and they would give us a petri dish and I don't know, paper towel, and we would get a bean and we put the bean in the petri dish with the paper towel. Well, I had some bag seed, okay. Eh? My dad had 14 elect- years old rolling around with bag seed. Dad How had much- electrical tape? <laughs> Daddy read in chat. He had electrical tape. You know what those electrical tape canisters used to look yep, like? Yeah. Dishes. Well, I put two and two together. <laughs> Daddy read, I'm going to borrow your electrical tape container. He might have one or two of those go missing back in the day. Pop a couple holes in that thing, stuck it. You know, the seed germinated. I said, Holy shit, I have a germinated seed. Mama Red, she's a master gardener. So she's got gardening equipment. She's a she's a green thumb. Uh, and a couple guess, handfuls of soil. You never miss it, mom. <laughs> you know, so so I started the plant in my window, and that sucker got three, four nodes tall. It started actually growing leaves, and I was like, all right, this thing's in my and my window wasn't upstairs. My window was in the basement, so ground level. Dad mows the grass right by the you know. So I'm lawnmowers going by. I move the plant. Lawnmower goes back. <laughs> I went, you know, so it's, it's, I'm trying to think of ways to grow it in my closet, you know, and nowadays there's like all kinds. So I used to try to think of all these like armoire setups. I build an armoire and put a grow light in there and all this stuff. And now reading up on PC cases stuff. and shit. Super cool. I wish I would have invested in, in building that stuff as a kid. You know, I was always all over building way too much stuff. So building ramps and shit like that. So I would have loved to have gotten into that. And I still may try to get into something that someday. Uh, I love working with wood. Uh, the um, that plant I ended up taking down to the woods behind my house with a buddy of mine, and this is where I learned that loose lips sink ships. First, and I was 14 years old. What a prime age to learn that. You know what I mean? It really mm. fucks your trust. Uh, <laughs> with, with with never too early, never too late to learn. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so I go on vacation after planting this this little plant down in the woods with a bucket. 
and I get back and this, this dude that I went down there with tries to sell me this little fucking pill container full of shake, no buds, just shake, just leaves. You know, it's July, you know, that plant was only knee high. It wasn't even a little bush. It was gone. That fucker tried to sell me my own plant. Learn real fast, man. The ways, you know, to just, you know, loose lips sink ships. And so I, I got really, when I first started to grow like indoor, that was when I was in my early 20s. I was I was living on my own. It was, um, if I could round out a year, it was probably 2007, 2008. Uh, definitely in the 2008 range when we went medical, I had no problem doing it. And I was living in a house in Dearborn. And I had a whole bunch of. So did you get your caregiver card like right off, like right when that turned medical? Uh, no, this was just me growing some plants up in there. Okay. I didn't have a caregiver card at the so time. So you just kind of saw that the culture was shifting and you're oh. like, all right, well, I can at least throw a couple of these in my, in my house or backyard or something. Yeah. I mean, it was already illegal for me to smell. I was smoking weed. Um, you know, I wasn't really, <sighs> you know, uh, I, I'd, I'd buy I'd buy a couple I, I wouldn't buy a couple dime bags because I was smoking a decent amount of weed by the time I was you know in college out of college. But had you ever been to a grow op at this point? Oh uh, no, no, okay. I never seen a plant. That's why I wanted to grow weed. It was mm -hmm. I'd never seen a plant, and I really wanted to see. I wanted to see how the flowers look like. I couldn't figure it out. I've seen High Times magazines, but it was always like curled up leafy weed you know what i mean it was and, and i couldn't figure out how the plant like looked and then i'd see it in high times and i was like all right it's kind of like this but it was never like the full thing you know i don't know i just really wanted to see it for myself yeah in person and uh and i eventually grew one and i started with some cfl lights on clamp light you know the shop lights with the clamps oh, yeah homes <laughs> uh added some v splitters screwed in some like 100 watt blue cfls for veg and then i don't know where the information was on like uh maybe um uh what were they i i'm ag i'm uh what were the what were the main ones on on uh maybe shroomery or even something like that i got some of that information on like there was not a lot of weed information there was a couple there was like a couple good uh uh sites and then all of the other information i learned about growing was learning how to grow tomatoes and peppers and show that i have and there was some of that information on youtube um and otherwise it was just documents on the internet books you would find learn how to grow stuff but my mom she was a master gardener she was always getting landscaping done i was always having to help work with landscaping my neighbors had gardens and i always had to go and uh well those were my first jobs making money as a kid was you know mowing lawns and also weeding gardens planting plants you know planting flats of fucking petunias and pansies and shit like that as a 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14, 17 year old forever. So, I mean, a lot of my hands-on experience comes from just that type of repetition work. Um, and then I really got the green thumb when I was probably 24, 25 and and at that time i think that, that was in like that 2008 maybe 2010 range i'd grown a plant done the thing my buddy had a had a garden and he made some pickles and i moved back home after growing that plant um under the cfls and uh actually a, a buddy of mine had given me a gymnasium light a thousand watt fucking globe big ass globe it didn't have the hood on it it just was a bulb attached to that square back. got it out of the stock room or something scooped oh, one of those big suckers in his backpack and with, with a really shifty fucking electric cable coming out of that thing you know what i mean oh, I plugged into an attic and, <laughs> and you could just see the heat coming off the attic you know like the heat signature you could literally see light coming out of the that attic. looks tasty wow, it's terrible that looks really good pedro what you got there Primal, primal punch from outdoor girl this year. Ooh, okay. The um, yeah. So 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 this so I get a, a clone swap for the light. Grows this plant huge. This plant fills out most of the attic. This one plant, and 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 I ended up cashing in on that plant with some people that I, I worked in the service industry. So here's a bag. Here's a bag. Here's a bag. Ended up buying a couple pounds off of the money that I got for that bag. Started kind of doing the same thing. A bunch of the people that were. 
a bunch of people that were there at the service in where I worked in service industry were going to Detroit, kind of shifty neighborhoods, pick up their bags. I knew some people I could get some weight from. So I kind of started just, I'll call it just splitting weight, right? People needed, people needed weed. I needed weed. So we just split the bags, right? So we split the bags um, and I'd get my weed for free, essentially. So, I mean, that's kind of how it all started. It was just really, I was a smoker and I was splitting bags with friends. I could go get weight and we'd all pitch in and I'd get my weed for free. And then, it, you know, from there, it turned into growing a little bit more. I ended up moving back home with my parents when I was in my early 20s. And that's when I really started a vegetable garden. That's the primal punch right there. Okay. The cool thing about that is that's my fourth poles. That's really? I thought it's that oh, so damn. So how fucking just oh, greasy and nasty. And he gave us a good Sorry. macro shot, right, of that one, Pedro, in our chat. And it is super clean still. Like super, super, super clean. That looks really nice. Anyways, so, sorry to interrupt. Oh, that's okay. With my visual. No, I I, I love being I love being distracted like that. I, uh, <laughs> fortunately, I, I kind of remember I'm at in the in the tale. But the the vegetable garden that I got into was really set up my green thumb. Um, I moved back to my parents' house and I got permission to like basically turn the entire back length of their yard into a a vegetable garden. And, and I really wanted to become a caregiver at this time. My friends convinced me to go get my medical card. I went and got my medical card. And by this time, it's like 2009, 2010, something like that. Um, I now moved back home because I have my dog, D-O-G, and he's a pup and he needs a place to stay. I was going to move to Detroit and do some, you know, shifty stuff, start a party house. And it just wasn't, you know, it was a terrible, was a terrible move. Moved back home to my parents, and I was I got a job managing out out here, out this way, at a, at a, at a bar, and ended up moving out here and buying a house. So that vegetable garden that I grew at my parents' house taught me a lot of skills, man. I, I was it wasn't organic. I was using the the blue water, you know, whatever. And, and I was also doing that when I grew that first plant. That first plant I grew, I didn't know how. To, I, I I thought maybe I'll grow some throw some shit from the backyard through some like soil from the backyard in a pot, you know, but I also went to home Depot and I got whatever, uh, I don't know. It was a high, high P whatever had a high P on it. You know what I mean? That's all I knew, you know, run, run a high P for flower NPK, run oh. a high P, you know what I mean? For the NPK, run a high Mid flower. big middle number. Give me that yeah, one. And, and don't <laughs> use miracle grow. That was my other, that was my other tip that I had was don't use miracle grow. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say you grabbed one of mom's miracle grow bags. Yeah, I don't know what this blue water is, but it makes me feel like it's probably I grabbed a miracle a different grow blue water. <laughs> I grabbed a different blue water. It was just a it was just a um a water soluble nutrient. I can't remember who it was by, but it was in a little green box. It wasn't yeah. Windex, right? Oh, okay. Oh, no. <laughs> and and I mixed that shit up and I grew some big fucking tomatoes and big fucking peppers, and I made a shit ton of pickles that year. I probably <laughs> still have this is from like 2012, 2013. I probably still have a jar of those pickles or, or garlic. I, I jarred up garlic that year, all kinds of shit, man. Damn, dude. Nice. And, how how big of a row were you talking? Um, it was probably 30 feet maybe 30 to 50 feet long and maybe six feet wide okay. and i mean i fucking went through that i i actually didn't till it i um i cut out the sod it was all grass it was a grass backyard so i cut out the sod uh with a shovel and then i went through it and i knew how because of my my research into like growing tomatoes and stuff it was all container shit so i perlite peat moss Daddy red says six by 40 six by 40 okay, <laughs> so it's 40 feet long so uh um i think that's the only thing he's fact checked you on by the way i, I was wondering yeah. if he like kind of like knew how much of this he knew was <laughs> he going on know. you know he, he, already, he knows where all my stash spots are up in the ceiling <laughs> been so many times man yeah they, they've got me it's cool yeah. your pop supports you so much my mom she's yeah. usually up here in the chat all the time too supports me big time probably more than probably more than anybody in my entire family is pretty cool yeah. It's what keeps me going, man. It really is. It really is uh, the support system. Um, I'm blessed to say the least. Um, I really am. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. They were, 
they were the type of parents that were real real strict with me i i wasn't able to like go to all the parties or like you know i had to be home at certain times and you know they were really checking on me if i was staying at pl people's places staying the night at places and don't get me wrong i had freedoms as a kid and had a lot of fun but like they were your you know they kept an eye on me and so be it i mean Two, two blocks from my house, a young girl, 14 years old, a friend of mine that I went to high school with, got her throat slit behind a dumpster. You know what I mean? So, And she's still alive to tell the story. So, I mean, that shit happens all over our fucking neighborhood. You know what I mean? So, and, and I mean, we were on the good side of town, believe. We are on the good side of the fucking, you know, the, basically just, it's it's a line in the road. You know what I mean? And you, you cross the line and it's a whole total different fucking neighborhood, you know? Uh, growing up in Westland, the difference between Westland and Norway and Wayne and and and, and all of these other areas that they have down there in, in Inkster and and it's right there. Um, uh, there's areas of, of Inkster that are pretty rough. There's areas of Westland that are pretty. There's, well, areas of Westland that are really nice, and and we lived on the nicer right over by like Westland Mall is kind of where I grew up. Um, and it's it's a it's a great part of time. I had a great time. You know, it was a type of town. I'd ride my bike for miles. You know what I mean? There, there were shitheads. There were like, you know, it's just like everywhere else, but you learn, mind your own business. I, I, had a, I had a great childhood, I feel. And honestly, coming out of it, I, you know, a lot of my friends um, went down the path of fentanyl and shit like that. And it's, it's really rough, man, to see, you know, all of, you know, that happened in that side of town. But um, the way that the cannabis came out, I saw a lot of people getting healed by cannabis over the years. And a lot of people just, I stayed with cannabis. I didn't think of, I never thought of cannabis as another drug, even though people started, you know, really showing addiction. And even though the propaganda was trying to really make it seem like cannabis was, was one of the, the players at fault, you know, I, I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it. And I, I stayed oh, with the cannabis. gateway drug. Remember? <laughs> yeah. And, and that was the, that was one of those realities that I saw because I, I always thought that, that alcohol um, and, and even coffee, really, I think coffee and, and, and some stuff like that is more of a gateway. Um, yeah. I mean, if we're talking gateway, we're talking what got you into this, right? So you yeah. can trace it back until the first fucking buzz you got and like period. i said for anything I was drinking that's your gateway drug then really guys needs my gateway to twinkies right <laughs> seriously yeah. you know seriously that's probably yeah exactly like like beka right fucking right here in chat this is the most this is the one sure. right there yeah yeah yeah, and, and and I'll get I'll get back on here too. Um, and yeah, she, Becca's walking around behind him. That's, so that's his wife. It. Ah, okay, perfect. I mean, that's yeah, my wife. She, my, my love, my hit the nail on the head right there. Seriously, it's exactly right. what I was getting at. A partner in crime. Uh, and but that's okay. We can sell that by the masses. No problem. Yeah. The uh, <laughs> um, it it cannabis has had a, a impact on my life since i was a fucking teenager man and and so that's why i'm i'm really dedicated to the ethos of it you know that, that includes the culture the growing like oh and, and honestly where cannabis is as an agricultural product and and how it is actually food and so so that that portion of my life when i was learning about cannabis in that portion of my life when i i got into growing a garden and making pickles learning those few life skills and i call them life skills because those are certainly even growing cannabis is a life skill learning those got me really interested in self-sustainability like really because i would get down all these rap and youtube wasn't that big at the time but it was big enough to have some like john kohler's show uh growing your greens with john kohler shout out to that dude because i learned more about growing plants and food from that dude he used it into my cannabis theory than anything you know and that dude was just showing people's farms and like just showing different products and 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 i never really had organic growing down but i always knew i always wanted to be organic and and when i got into growing when i bought this house and i was able to like grow plants at a larger scale for me it was a closet now it wasn't just one plant in an attic it was 
I can grow a closet out. I can grow a bedroom out. I can have a hydro. And I was really into hydroponics. I thought hydroponics, you know, the way of the future, growing plants indoors with water um, and all that. And, and, and I was kind of almost, I almost had blinders on thinking that it could all be done at, at, at the same time with organics and hydroponics, not really thinking of soil building, not really thinking of biology, but just thinking of clean organically sourced inputs basically more like using technology also like i really like the technology aspect of hydro uh and also the automation i like the automation yeah. play the walk away um i really liked all of that stuff and and being able to like set up a grow and just kind of let it do your own thing and i always wanted to grow with all these different plants in it well then it wasn't just being a caregiver and growing some plants for some other people. Now all of a sudden we had this commercial opportunity step into play in like 2015, 2016 started really listening to other, other professionals talk about cannabis and the way that it was in other areas, you know, prepare for the $500 pound, you know, set up your systems properly, you know, don't sell your intellectual property, you know, watch who you do business with. All of these, excuse me, all of these different uh, cautions, I suppose. I, mean, I don't want to say fears, but like cautions that, you know, are certainly realities. So, um, you know, I've definitely been stepped on a few times in the industry. I've been taken advantage of. I've been stolen from, you know, I've been robbed, you know, and people have been robbed on my behalf. I mean, shit, dude, you know, like all kinds of shit. Um, I, I still think I'm just maybe still broken even you know even though i've been doing this shit for i don't know a couple decades now it's it's crazy to think about but you know getting um getting into getting into it <clears throat> where i really wanted to be sustainable most importantly um i learned that 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 trying to do it hydro and trying to do it organic I had some competing variables. I'm going to use that word. I like the word. Uh, he said it, guys. He said it. <laughs> like one of them being, you know, keeping everything clean. Um, another one being, you know, just I was using Roots Organic and it was really expensive <clears throat> to use their whole line. Um, so and, and the other one, the other one was just honestly the the, the product that I was putting out here mind you i didn't have an air conditioner i was using hps they're really close to the there's a ton of other variables putting out shitty weed but my friends were growing really fucking good weed and by this time i was a caregiver and this is 2012 i had gotten my card uh daddy red their neighbor uh where i grew up their neighbor had uh um uh, something going on with his eye where he really couldn't see well and he was having muscle his muscle spasms in his eyes and he really needed purple kush specifically all all these other strains just wouldn't work for him he was going to the dispensers at the time and you know he's getting all these other ones just not working as well i was able to source granddaddy purple through my friends and they had this gdp and it would it worked for this dude and i eventually I grew for him. He was my first patient. He was my patient for like three years. I eventually got him a clone of that after I sourced it in like 2015. <clears throat> kind of like teach a man to fish, fish for the rest of his life. Well, he didn't need me as a patient anymore. He was the first patient that kind of like said, I'm, you know, I'm going to leave. And so that opened me up to a whole nother batch of possibilities, which was, you know, obviously having other patients and things like that and other people needing, needing cannabis, but really learning the, the medical value, not just cannabis, but that specific varietal and that other varietals make conditions worse and that there's, there's a polarity there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, and, that, and, and that, that, that some people really need a specific strain of cannabis, you know, and, and that really toned me into like the caregiving side of, of growing cannabis and that really tuned me into like the craft side of, of of focusing on varietals focusing on not just growing weed as an herb or as a ornamental or as even a high thc potent market marketing tool right but as 
as a, 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 a color on the color wheel, like every mm. day bridal and, and, and knowing that as an artist, you don't just, you, you don't just pick three color. You don't just pick three colors. You, you mix them together, you make other colors or you buy the other colors that somebody else mixed together. Well, hey, some people like to do monochromatic type, you know, paintings. You, you like to, okay. You know, but everyone's got their style, but you, I mean, clearly you've, you've, you've grown a quite a few varietals and I want to, I want to call them, I'll call it strains because sometimes we do pheno hunts. So we pop full packs of seeds and, you know, maybe we grow them all the way out. Maybe some of them are males. We kick them to the curb. Um, how many different strains do you think you've grown over your, you know, like you said about a decade or so of like seriously growing and how many are you operating with right now? Not that many, honestly, I would say that I'm in the range probably, I probably between 50 and a hundred, I'd have to probably say between that you've grown maybe in like the 60 to 80 range, somewhere in there. More keep popping into my head as I say, I know it's so hard to quantify this. <laughs> I want to say less, I want to say less than a hundred um, different like varietals. It hasn't been that many. Uh, yeah, I I, when I first started out, it was a oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Superior, oh, sorry. no, I, I, I was trying to quantify it too in my head. I, I don't know, but a hundred. Yeah. yeah. Just thinking back a hundred sounds right. Like, hundred sounds like a lot. It does, me. but it also sounds. I feel like I've definitely had my hands on hundred packs of seeds, and uh, you know, between oh, seeds yeah. and clones, for sure that well, many. I just don't think I've popped them all. You know, <laughs> but <laughs> my seed, seed, box, back, like my I've seed had story. Um, but the 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 varietal, like in the beginning, I was going through some stuff, trying to find stuff that would work. I, I was trying to find stuff that 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 my patients. That I, I really liked. Uh, and I was also trying to find stuff that would work for a, a couple of my patients that I had at the time. And then, it, so where, where I'm at regionally in Michigan, there's dispensaries everywhere. And there has been since like 2008, honestly, mm -hmm. in here forever. Um, and, and I mean, the very first dispensary in Michigan is two miles from my house. So dispensaries have been surrounding me forever. Um, and and maybe it's maybe it's four miles from my house or something like that, but it's right down right up the fucking road. And and um that's a roach I'm trying to figure out that shit distracted me everywhere. The um uh so the market the marketability of cannabis has always been difficult. There's always been good caregiver weed in these dispensaries. Um there's always been low prices also. So it's competitive for sure. I mean, it's only getting more so, but you know, and so when I first started, actually, I was more or less, you know, middlemanning product from other caregivers as a caregiver for my patients until I started getting my crops kind of up and running here, which was a great thing that we could do at the time. At the beginning of the Michigan program, you could I think until like 2014 or 15, where they really changed the what was it like um patient to patient laws where they had uh these like you know patients could sort of swap product and, and and what's nice about the the patient caregiver laws in michigan is as a patient caregiver patient or caregiver that grows or grows for somebody else you're allowed to to get recuperated you know on on the spendings that you use for you know what whatever your time costs whatever your electrical talk costs what all this costs that go into it you're you know you're allowed to charge for those things and that's that's been a great almost advantage as small business cannabis business entrepreneurs for the caregivers to be able to get their overages to other patients and there was a time where overages were, were a thing um and now the overages you know that that kind of went away in you know 2014 2015 again uh gray areas kept things working then we had legal recreational come through and and you know as a consultant you know we can work for our time and we're allowed to gift cannabis to anybody over 21 so the business models have all kind of changed over the years but the value of the plant the care in caregive um it all remains the the craft remains the focus and attention on single varietals as of today, I only work with how many varietals do we have? 
I'd say there's 12 varietals in our shop right now. Um, I've, I've been with those same 12 varietals for the last, I think three years. I might've, oh, we called, we called one or two last year. So we had quite a few more. Um, but I really haven't popped seeds in like three years. It's been a while since I did rainbow driver, strawberries and cream and a couple of those other ones. Um, and I've held on to those for a while. I did the hunting on rainbow and strawberries, but a lot of the other genetics that I do hold have been gifts or, you know, some of them were sourced through dispensaries, but a lot of them were gifts through close friends. I, I hold that granddaddy purple still. Um, and I was able to get it from my friend. Uh, now, originally my friend had told me that he, he grows with flora and Nova and GH. And that's what I originally started hydro after I was working growing with roots organics until my other friend who's a little bit more business savvy uh and was kind of like friends of all of us in the circle told me he said actually they're using jacks and you should use jacks as hydro and i really was organic i really wanted to do organic but also again listen to everybody's information online listening to you, you know all the podcasts you know, kiss organic, like listen to every, I was listening to everybody, Shango Low. So listen to, uh, I really have shot at the grow tube because coming up, I learned a shit ton on the grow tube. And so, you know, for Groly, Pedro, you guys were a big part of that show, uh, back in the day and, you know, before the, the YouTube crash and a lot of the information yeah. got taken away. I mean, I'd be sitting there trimming or just working on my grow room or building a grow room or something and listening to that. You guys taught me a ton of information and I was actually working with, and the, one of the big reasons I really enjoyed the grow tube was because the information was great, but you had a lot of guys in different aspects of the industry, you know, uh, guy, lighting experts, hydroponic experts, soil guy, uh, Pedro, you know, you, you work, uh, organic and then like, uh, green jeans, breeders and hydro and then Vader with, and then for girl, you did the, 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 the hydrocarbon and, uh, and Pedro, you did uh, rosin and, and at the time washing hash. And and so all of these different theories coming together and to not really pick a single like dogma, right? Or to not be dogmatic about maybe one style and to maybe be open minded about many different styles. But one of the other things was I was also growing with Jacks and there was somebody on the panel that grew with Jack. Green Jeans grew with Jack. So I was able to get a lot of good information from how he did his. And it was from that show that I actually started using magnesium sulfate. I used to only use Jack's with as a two part. I just ran the the three and the two. I never did three. I never knew what three, two, one was. I just ran Jack's. I fucking ran Jack's because I've been running Jack's for fucking years, you know, and all of a sudden Jack's three, two, one is a new term for me. So I started running Jack's three, two, one. I have great fucking results better results um start paying attention to my ph you know things like that at the time i was just letting it buffer let it do its thing um <clears throat> so that show i i really thank to a lot of progress um as far still as using jacks right now i still use jacks indoor are you hydro are you what kind of media indoor hydro uh, i run a cocoa media i've gone through different types of cocoa i've gone with cocoa without perlite i used to use just canna then there was a uh, there was a heavy metal scare here in Michigan in like fuck, I don't know 2019 something like that. There was uh, Ooh, yeah, a little before scare. that, maybe 17, 18. And and so I kind of stopped using Canna because I was trying to get into metric and I was trying to get everything dialed in, get all my ducks in a row, including being able to to support a five hundred dollar pound if necessary. And that's one of the main reasons that I was learning hydro. I was learning to produce a low cost. A uh, high value product that I could stand behind, and it's and hard to beat that price of Jacks in a twenty five pound <laughs> bag. Last <laughs> summer, last summer I spent five hundred dollars. I'm up to my elbows in Jacks. I will have fertilizer on my grow. Like Ten years of freaking Jack, <laughs> dude. I'm not kidding you. We've gone through one bag of fertilizer and one bag of cow nitrate. I bought six and three. I bought six wow. and three. Yeah, or at least you got them in the right ratios, though, right? Yeah, the right ratio. Ratio. yeah. so I, I bought like my problem. Like, my, my first order was 25 pound bags, fuck, dude. and you run out of that, that, that first part, and you're like, oh, yeah, shit. yeah, yeah. And then no, you, yeah. Yep, yep. 
Yeah, so I bought three bags and two, and then I was like, you know what? I got these for like a couple hundred bucks. Yeah, right. And at the time, it, and here's the part, it was last summer was when, you know, the fertilizer uh, price hike was happening, right? And all the farmers were going on strike and all the shit was happening and shit was hitting the fan. So I was going, you know what? This fertilizer is going to double in price. I better jump now. And, and it was on sale at the time. Uh, Grogren had a sale. So I just bought a little bit of it and now I'm kind of stuck with it for a little while. But it's a low cost. So, I mean, I'm able to grow it pennies on doubt. And I do run cocoa. My biggest cost is I think we figured out to be like, it's like three bucks a plant in cocoa. Uh, well, the biggest cost is electricity. I still run HPS. So air conditioning, lighting. Ooh. What are you going to make that jump, dude? Uh, as soon as we have financing available. Yeah. yeah. But anyways, the um, – the because it's more than just getting the lights we have to reconfigure some or get the lights and a controller and you know what i mean there's just some other stuff so anyways mm-hmm. the um the where was i going with that the, so your three dollars cocoa electricity is the most expensive part electricity is most expensive Jax is obviously super cheap <laughs> Jax is super cheap um you're running like probably scrog netting stuff like that Nothing yeah like yeah we're on, we're on scrog net we uh you know, five ton air conditioner, uh, CO2, natural gas, CO2, uh, sealed room, completely sealed rooms. In 2015, we purchased a 3,200 square foot warehouse uh, commercial. We were assuming that we would be able to get an operator's permit being the way that the MMMA was written. It wouldn't be an issue. The township would have our backs. We'd be able to operate and sell to the dispensaries. In 2016, while I'm building these grow rooms, the MRTMA, Michigan, ah, fuck, uh, no, MMFLA, Michigan Medical Facility Licensing Act, gets adopted through the state. The state legislator in 2016 adopted a licensing commercial program for medical, not for caregivers, not for anything like that. You had to get township approval. You had to get operator's permit and township approval. Then you had to pay township fees. Then you had to get a state license. Then you had to get metric. You had to run through transport. You had to do the whole. It was a pre. They they knew that recreational was coming basically because the wall was being built around the uh, the grassroots effort to getting it on the ballot, um, which eventually it did in 2018 and got passed. But <laughs> the wall was being built, right? And, and and the the uh <laughs> sorry that got me i know i've seen constant evolution say i can talk you you if you've ever seen one of the michigan bros grocery i can talk it's no <laughs> so so the uh our township says no to that so we have this facility i'm in the middle of a build out we're still able to sell to dispensaries. They're actually now allowing dispensaries to purchase from caregivers. And we were just kind of in this purgatory for the time being. And then recreational dropped in 2018. Our township still said no to that option. And we have just been kind of riding the rails where we were at. So not really wanting to expand uh that as far as cannabis goes because we don't really have township approval and we don't want to get backtracked by the township we're going to owe them fines and stuff because we didn't pull permits so there's there's all those hurdles and then our town township we tried working with the township and they don't want to adopt it so there's going to need to be you know township business going on so we have been doing the discretion uh you know writing the um caregiver consultation uh, marketplace thing as caregivers for the last couple of years professionally. Uh, also, I'm a, a wedding DJ professionally. And so that is, you know, there really to help support our income. Otherwise, you know, caregiving is our primary income. Cannabis has been our primary source of sustainability. And in the last couple of years, because sustainability is so important, my end goal has always been a farm, a vegetable farm. Um, and cannabis has always been my idea as being a great bridge to kind of bridge the gap for that. And so that's really what I've been trying to utilize is cannabis as this great stepping stone because it helps so many people. And then it also bridges the gap into the food because 
food is also medicine uh, and, and health and wellness. And it's, it's all combined as this holistic approach uh, as cannabis being an agricultural commodity. So I met Becca in 2021 in March and her and I have just been, you know, going tag teaming the, uh, the caregiving thing. She became a caregiver around the, the same, just after we met, she kind of learned the, the trade we met, she worked in cannabis. We were both working conventionally. I was working at a dispensary and she was working as a sales rep and she came in and, and we met, <clears throat> went out on a date and now we're married. Was it love at first sight? Did you guys like lock eyes? What happened? It, it was only eyes because we had masks on. It was COVID. Oh uh, yeah. So, so we could only see eyes. Uh, and yeah, man, honestly, uh, it was great. We went on a date and that was the first time I actually got to see her face. So it was kind of like a, kind of like a blind date and we met each other, but didn't see each other. Um, and yeah, yeah, we, we wed and now we are life partners, business partners. She's definitely the second half, the better half to you said we, wed. we wed. She's laughing. <laughs> we, uh, we got the red setter farm thing dialed in now, you know, we, we really love the marketplace that Michigan has. Um, we, we love, you know, the promoters, the event space. We love the quality. We, we love the craft, you know, and, and, we grow organically outdoors so we don't have to get into that yet so well we this is perfect time we're one, we're one hour and you you mentioned the dj thing i don't think you need to to necessarily plug that but uh with the you know events coming up in which both you and i will be uh vending at this weekend why don't you go ahead and plug you know where you're at on instagram what your kind of events are doing uh and then we'll keep rolling the events that we are primarily doing are the third eye craft affair and you can get that information uh, from what information that i got instagram is mostly uh it's actually on discord and you can find some reddit links on michigan 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 i keep getting those mess mixed up but <clears throat> either way <laughs> if you're on instagram uh third eye muse and third eye craft affair uh runs a market at the fledge in lansing just about every other week. There's been a couple weeks off. There's been a couple months here and there taken off, but consistently in the winter time, it's just about every other week. And right now, this week, it's on a Sunday, 11, 11 to 5 p.m. And some of the last past weeks has been on Saturdays, noon to six. So my story for Groly's story, usually always posting about it. Definitely Third Eye Craft Affair. You will always find that information. What's really nice is that you get discounts on entry fees if you bring clothing, canned food. Uh, I'll talk about the Fledge a little bit, the location that most of these events are located at. Um, it's kind of a little community center. Um, you know, there's uh, substance abuse awareness. There's you know, uh, a small shelter on really, really cold nights if necessary. There's a food pantry, a clothing closet. There's uh, a garden, hydroponics. They, they got all kinds of stuff going on in there. They've even got a they little have chickens corn. now. They have chickens running around outside. Yeah, yeah. They kind of. It's crazy how like they stay. They stick uh, around there, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Permaculture. Um, uh, it's in downtown Lansing. It's, it's, I mean, it's not like, uh, you know, yeah. It kind of reminds me of like what would be now. I know it's on the other side of the town and it's not student ghetto area, but it kind of reminds me of like, what would be like, like there's lots of student housing, yeah, like, like student housing. Like there's a random community center, you know, like, but it's not student area community center. It's closer no. to capital area. Yeah. Yeah. You peek around the corner you see the capitol building yeah you know, like <laughs> right up right on michigan Ave. oh yeah. but yeah it's that's, that's a great one and then uh summertime events we really enjoy doing events at sarns Re resort with gems and genetics and whatever other events that they they host we try to do events with those guys and then with <clears throat> with the other venture we're really trying to get our our food service kicked off we really want to diversify um want to expand and it's difficult to expand in the cannabis space right now our, our township's not doing the licensing thing or anything so the next best place to expand is into the food space and so that's kind of what we're doing we already have all of the equipment we already have the skills we already have the know-how next best thing is 
get yourself some seeds. So we stocked up on a whole bunch of seeds. We got love Johnny's <laughs> little box of seeds right here from Johnny. Yeah. Nice and full. We, uh, yeah. I got dirty soil blockers right here. Just did some soil blocks tonight. Got to clean those up. But um, yeah, this is here. Some more or less more Johnny's lettuce packs. We like Johnny's for like production stuff. And then we like Baker Creek. Baker yeah. Creek's got, got good stuff. And then uh, locally, we like MI Gardener. Mm -hmm. He's uh, awesome. He's got really, really good stuff. Um, we would like to get where our where our warehouse is, where we grow, that we have a little bit of proper small acreage, like less than two acres. But nonetheless, enough property to have a small garden, a small market garden. So that's kind of what we're working towards. Uh, we would like to eventually get it certified organic. We'll see how that rolls out, but definitely working with organic standards and practices right now, including even trying to source what seed we can. Fortunately, Johnny's has organic seed. It's not much more expensive. Uh, so we're sourcing the seed if we're able through that. And we're going to document, log everything. Um, yeah, gonna... It's got to be like a certain number of years you have to grow like that before we... you certify or something, right? Three years of not spraying anything on the property, and I believe oh, okay. three years of monitoring. Um, honestly, I have the last three years monitored and logged if I have to because I haven't done anything to that side of the property. I haven't done shit. So um, I've only mowed the grass. Mm -hmm. That's it. I haven't sprayed anything. Um, I haven't touched it with any. I haven't even put, like, you know, I haven't sprayed beehives or anything. So. I'll, I'll talk to I'll talk to an extension. I'll, I'll call the ags. The thing is expensive. It's like ten grand. We don't have the capital right now, so it's mm -hmm. it's definitely a future investment. But to prepare, right, to get the garden started, I mean, just preparing land and in soil alone is going to take the better part of, of a year, if not years. So we get it at least started. Get you know infrastructure, fencing. There's deer. Got to get everything taken care of. So we expect it to take a couple years to get up and running. But but you know it's a learning curve also trying to grow at scale because right now we do backyard gardening backyard farming we have cannabis mixed in it's more permaculture in food forest right now where we just let shit grow wild we just let radishes fucking come up everywhere yeah. because i love them botanically i think that they're a beautiful flower and i enjoy eating radish pods and that's my and style up here too we're just growing shit. shit everywhere we got land just let everything grow yeah. And and it was their backdrop to their wedding. It was really cool. This past year, we put a lot of focus in the design as far as it being a backdrop to our wedding. Yeah, we, we got married in our right. wedding. We got married in our wedding. We got married in our backyard this year. And it was, uh, uh, it, it, we really got to learn how to like grow flowers. This year. You know, I always grow like some medicinals, you know, uh, herbs, stuff like that. But this year, we really got into flower production. Like Becca grew dahlias and, snapdragons chamomile and speaking of chamomile we took a ton of herbs and we're still having tea like every night out of our garden so i mean the food ran out we, we have tomato sauce spaghetti sauce and shit that's all 100 percent out of our garden so that's we got 52 jars we made 52 pints of spaghetti sauce this year one for every week of the year all <laughs> nice and and it, it, it's food right it you know it's nourishment etc but i'm a little bit woo woo it's my connection to the garden you know what i mean it's our connection to the soil in michigan in the in the ground freezes and this this death comes you know of winter it's our winter reset i try not to look and i try not to look at it as like a bad view of, of death coming because it's it's beautiful in the spring when it resets you know it's it's nature's way of resetting itself and for me to be able to stay in tune with it in the winter time in that you know sunless dreary season stay connected to the garden through your you know your your harvest so even when the sauce and the food runs out we have the teas we have the botanicals we grow a little bit of everything i, I love permaculture i love permaculture design uh we really want to implement all of that kind of stuff uh ecological systems into our farm um i love closing loops and just really uh, trying to not bring in, in inputs. Um, before the pandemic happened, one of my goals was to really close loops, not to be relied on the supply chain. And then the pandemic happened and we couldn't find toilet paper and it was crazy. And I was like, well, 
the supply chain does have error. Like there are, can be issues in supply chain. So if I am very reliant on something from a store, that is a, you know, that's a, a sliver of, of uh, fragility, you know, and if I want to, you know, add a little bit of anti-fragility, you know, to my, to my system, just try to close some loops and try to do things as best. Like that's kind of where the soil blocker comes in, you know, just one of these tools, tools like this. And now we don't rely on, on plastic uh, seed trays. We don't rely on uh, seed pods. We don't rely on root riot cubes. A lot Depends of on how far it gets red, because uh, from what I hear, all you need is salt and bullets. Hey, I got a burning question for you. Can you define hash for us? <laughs> I see you in chat all the time. I know you know this is coming. Hash hashish. Hash or hashish. Hash hash. Okay, yeah. So hash hash, I believe, is a modern, modern version of of what what is hashish. But I believe that the the modern version of it of hash encompasses uh, extracts of cannabis. Whereas an original uh, let's say traditional hashish terminology may encompass the living glands, uh, potentially um, uh, hand hand rubbed, uh, living off of off of the plant, or or potentially sieved mechanically. Um, uh, whereas the modern the modern day, and you know, well, you know what, even even then, they would probably have some sort of solvent tincture or something i don't know if they would necessarily consider that hashish but uh yeah i would say that as a modern a modern definition of it it would just be plant extract in a kind of smokable smokable specific form um whether that's uh whether that's a dab um whether that's uh something that you're going to put in your joint or something like that now hashish you can eat hash you know hash eaters for centuries um how does that affect the color of your teeth it's definitely gonna make them stick together a little bit <laughs> Dude, well, it depends on if you chew or if you swallow feel of wax what if you put it in your lip like a dip i would consider rso i would consider rso as a form of hash in a in a modern definition i would consider uh bho a form of hash in a modern definition uh, my rosin oil yeah rosin oil any of that stuff hash oil you know um in in in, in all of those I, I i don't think viscosity really matters as long as it's from the extracted glands of the cannabis plant for that matter and on, i mean you can have hashes of all kinds of pollens right you can have pollen hash of, of many different botanicals plants make terpenes uh hops has the cousin of cannabis has their terpenes you can make all right all right you want to talk terpenes? Let's, let's why don't you tell us about your favorite terpenes and your favorite cannabinoids because i mean I'm, everyone knows about thc it's the one that gets you high and then all of a sudden cbd comes around you start seeing that in like gas stations and stuff and now we got all these other ones that we've talked about and just explored and uh you know discovered over and over again it seems like uh, between that and terpenes, and if you don't, you don't have to give us specific terpenes, but maybe terpene profiles. Like, what are, what do you like? As far as cannabinoids go, I'm not well versed in the like newer minor cannabinoids. You know, the, there's so uh, many. <laughs> there's so many. The new one, the THC ten or whatever that fucker one is, or and then there's they're uh, starting to sound like Terminator names, you know. Yeah, so, so I don't know. They're all there. I've been smoking many, many varieties of cannabis over the years. I'm sure I've I'm sure I've had a, a couple of them. But either way, um, my favorite range of cannabis. This is from getting products tested at the lab. is is in the range of about twenty to twenty two percent. Twenty two. I'm gonna go twenty two to twenty five percent. I really like Death Star. That one really tests out around twenty five percent. So twenty twenty five twenty two to twenty five percent. Granddaddy Purple never really hit the 20% mark, but it would always slap me in the face. But something else about that one made me not like it. It wasn't that it wasn't potent. It was just that it was it maybe like provoked thought a little bit too much. It was just a little bit too scary of weed. So like 
I is never really turned on by an inflated THC value. I never really took that into consideration. Um, so THC is definitely not my favorite cannabinoid. I really do enjoy CBD. I like C having a CBD tincture. Uh, one of the reasons I'm probably so unstoppable with the speech and, and blabbing so much, I haven't had CBD oil in a while. So I am probably just a little more nervous than usual. Um, and when I'm nervous, I talk a lot. So that, that just goes hand in hand. There's, um, the, now we have been, we have been using CB, CBG in our, in, in our CBD. I do like that. I have, I, have, I don't think I've noticed, um, uh, an effective dose or, or I don't think I've noticed like effectivity from it from dosing from it, but I also haven't dosed much of it. Limited dosing. So I, I it seems to go hand in hand with specific terpenes a lot in my experience in lab testing. And so I'm wondering if it's like if that's the modulator, right? Or the or the terpenes are the modulator or maybe the combination of them are the modulator because it always seems like those hazy type well, varieties, terpenoline well, or whatever. Well, that's interesting to say hazy type varieties because those ones usually take a much longer they have a long right. growing time. And so if you're harvesting earlier than that, you know, oh, maybe 11 weeks or something. <laughs> yeah, if you don't take it 15 weeks. Maybe it needs right. 15 weeks. You know, mm -hmm. you're only taking it 11 weeks. And you are getting more CBG because of that. Um, because my understanding, CBG is a precursor to CBD and THC. And so it kind of goes through this phase as the flower produces where it's high in CBG. And then they convert into those other cannabinoids before converting to CBN <clears throat> and then degrading much, much longer down the line. I think one of my favorite aspects of the, of the plant itself is how long it actually takes for the cannabinoids to degrade uh, because they don't really degrade right away. You can literally leave them in the sun for a year and the cannabinoids will linger. The terpenes might be shot, but the resins will just like glass up on the plant and you know make it make a different product maybe a year is a little bit over, over well, yeah i don't know about in the sun for a year but you know lack of right. oxidation you know if you're if you can seal it up and keep it maybe in a cool dark place there's yeah, even it's... there's even like there's even ways of curing and drying that were poor cure like if you think of like mm -hmm. the way that they they dry some things around the world they feel dry many crops around the world um and we know that that doesn't do the best for phytonutrition preservation, but it does things. Uh, it does things to aid in the quality of the and, and actually kind of like what we adapt to. Also, um, wow. off topic, ever so slightly, but a good example of that is the the wheat grain, <clears throat> the way that it used to be harvested in you know prior to the prior to the conventional you know uh, uh sickle uh pr prior to the conventional um reaper in the conventional silo um where wheat is dried almost immediately as it's taken off of the field and taken off the field heat it's dried and 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 it's no longer left in the field now you know prior prior to the reaper prior to the silo we would harvest wheat and grain and we would leave it in the field to dry. And, you know, you'd bundle it up and you'd stack it out. You've seen those pictures of the wheat, wheat stacked out in the field. And, and it would dry during the day. But at nighttime, the dew would set and it would get a little wet. So it would go through these wet, dry, wet, dry periods. And over time, over the you know the course of however long it's taken to dry in the field, it would ferment a little bit. And during that, that, that fermentation the the gluten con the gluten enzymes would actually be i don't know if i don't know if deactivate is the right word but i'm going to explain it as it it becomes deactivated as far as it not being responsible for interrupting the human digestive system when consumed so what happened in the modern technology modern day is we we harvest the wheat the wheat does not ferment in the field. It, it's almost like fresh frozen. It, it gets preserved, which is great. We, we, we restore the phytonutrition. But in that same sense, we actually reduce the ability for us to digest it, you know, because we've adapted to that one method of agriculture for so long 
you know, as far as human, I mean, we've been on the earth for how many millennia, you know, and we've adapted with agriculture and the ways of doing me and even ingesting certain bacteria is based on the ways that we do our agriculture, you know, and, 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 and cannabis being one of those forms of agriculture, cannabinoids. And I, and I'm one of those people who believes in co-evolution with cannabis. You know, we have an endocannabinoid system because we have used cannabis as a food source or our animals that we consume have used cannabis as a food source. Um, I think it's fascinating thinking of the, you know, history or anthropology of it, but I, I like full profile. CBD, a little bit of everything. We're breeding to have a little bit of CBD and some stock. Um, a, a full spectrum, you know. Uh, That's fair. Cannabis is broad spectrum at best. You know. That's fair. Um, I, do you have a favorite piece of glass that you smell? I, so I know you're a huge bong or a huge bong, a huge um, a joint smoker. I think you've rolled one or two on the show, or at least started rolling one. I, I noticed yeah, my, my weed's so far away. I have to go 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 gadget arm and get it and the gadget arm's not working at the moment so I okay to... i didn't know if it was close or not but uh i, I was uh, do you have the um the hash dome oh there you go oh uh, i think so i wanted you to show i so this is definitely a different type of glass okay. pedro okay. but I'm, I'm curious to hear what pedro's take is on this and i'm i have to imagine the, he's familiar uh, with this apple one. What's the, yeah, probably. I don't know. Would you say the hash apple? I uh, know not like a in the shape of an apple, if that's what you're no, saying. No, no, yeah, no, it's yeah. just the dome. Yeah, it has hash on it. It might be this piece of full melt that, like, yeah, the one that like, is really like melted off. <laughs> yeah, have you ever seen one of those, Pedro? We actually got it. There we go. Hey, he's got a oh, that's nice. Is that where you put the hash on the uh, pan inside there? Yeah. yeah. Gold leaf banding, and then the, the hash goes on the nail there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you light that fucker up, and then you might be oh, broken. <laughs> oh, Pedro, Pedro, I, I want your take on this. Uh, I'll I'll be right back. You want my take on the, on the little piece there? Um, I mean... A little piece of glass. It, it's it's definitely an old school way of of consumption for sure. Uh, you think of, I mean, if we think of what you were saying, they're talking about the endocannabinoid system, you know, having developed over the millennia. Um, how do you think we smoked it? You know, do you, do you think we do you think we put it in a ten millimeter dab rig and heated it up with a blazer torch and you know, no, we didn't do that. We probably most likely, you know, we started probably putting it uh like you said on little nails uh potentially mixing it with, mixing it with our with our tobacco when we consume the tobacco in ritualistic fashion you know um but no i mean that's a great way to do it that's a that to me would be a little more of a meditation kind of consumption you know, where it would be literally burning as an incense around you, exactly. not necessarily consumed directly, you know, in the sense of an actual device where you're, you know. It's, not, it's nice that you can pass it, though, too. You can you, get a good chunk on there, get it burning. I don't know what's but cool I mean, about this. Is but I mean, if you think oh, about yeah. if you think about a ritual where you're all, you know, perhaps sitting in inside a domed, you know, like a mm -hmm. tent or something, and you've got, you know, eight, 10 or 12 of those sitting around the room just burning off, you know, um, I mean, that's a that would be a, a, a definitely an easy way to consume and an easy way to um make it a ritualistic kind of session you know there was uh i i was i was fortunate to be able to take a, a vacation to beijing when i was young i was like 13 years old and it was actually around the time i was just getting into cannabis and i went into what's known as the the lama temples and you go through a temple, a temple, a temple. And as you progress, there's Buddhas and the Buddhas get bigger and the Buddhas, there's more Buddhas in the temples. And the last temple, there's a 50 foot Buddha and there's Buddhas everywhere. And in every temple, you can smell the opium burning. In this mm. place. 
burns. You know, it's a very familiar smell, this raw opium that burns. And it's not like they're there smoking opium. It's just burning as incense. It's just burning as an incense. Absolutely. Right. right. Absolutely. But yeah, I mean, in the air and, you know, and you feel calm being in that place, you know, <laughs> you you feel the Buddha there, man. You Absolutely. really do. And, and, you know, like I said, you know, burning 10 or 12 of those sitting around a room or whatnot. Um, yeah, it would definitely yeah. affect the mind, right? It would definitely put you in a, in a certain place for sure. I, I would imagine those would be the first the first types of encounter. Well, I'd say the first encounters with cannabis is probably some form of eating it. And I would the, assume the, so. The seeds are the yeah, seeds are it. not and they're they're very uh hardy for us. They're very hardy. Um I believe that we can survive because the omega content of cannabis hemp seed has high omega not just three like most not or not just six like most times behind it's, it's balanced basically is what i'm trying to say and uh calories do so much for us but it's really the omega fatty acids that sustain us and and keep us healthy and, and prolong our life and um <clears throat> that alone can sustain us which is an amazing thing not to mention the leaves with the phytonutrition, <coughs> fiber, things like that. But phyto, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> think of calcium. Cannabis is the high calcium uptaking plant. And that right there is why I like a rig. Oh, yeah. The, the, the blast your lungs out. The dry, direct, stale hit. That, that it avoids? That you don't that, rig. yeah when you have when you smoke out of a rig yeah, yeah you know i mean that's old school and everybody has their old school ways you know and everybody appreciates their old school things i even have some old school things back here but that's just speaking of that you know do you do you, and that was going to lead me to my next question is do you consume obviously we saw you consume some consuming flour we've seen, seen you consuming some hash there do you consume you know, of course, now your definition includes it in hash, but do you consume uh, rosin or any type of the BHO or anything? Yeah, yeah, totally. Now, I'm usually not the one to fire up the torch. Beck is usually the one to uh, to fire up the torch and oh, shit. clean out the rig. Um, <clears throat> I I enjoy dabs. I enjoy I, I enjoy like flavorful extracts. I really enjoy what for shit for girl he makes and he makes really good high high terpene extracts now i'm not one to make that my primary source of consumption um that for many 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 reasons i won't even get into the reasons but for many many of them um whether it's hydrocarbon whether it's rosin any of them i, I do prefer flour for i think the just the full plant profile, even though I'm smoking some plant matter. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a cigarette smoker for many, many years. And <clears throat> something about the harshness of the smoke allows me to really just take it all in. You know, even, even if it gives me the gurgly coughs or something like that. It's it's part of the experience, I guess, from... Got a cough to get off, as they say. That's probably one of the best explanations I've ever heard of, of actually why you want to smoke. The, I, well, I do. I, flower, I enjoy yeah. the... Yeah, I flower, enjoy excuse that. me. I enjoy you that. know, because I, I've heard the... I've heard the the full spectrum, you know, and I've even claimed full spectrum for a long time, you know, and that's why, I, you know, wash a 45 to 159 or 73 to 159, but... but acknowledging that you're actually smoking the plant matter and that it's actually fucking with your lungs and everything and acknowledging that that's part of the experience is probably one of the best explanations I've ever heard. And, and, I, and, I, and I was a cigarette smoker for a long time. As was I. Habitually, it, it's there a little bit. And, and the big one is, is I do enjoy smoking primarily joints because of that that old cigarette habit. So a, I enjoy a, yeah. And again, part of the experience, I enjoy rolling one up you know i, just I really can hate rolling them up i am not a joint roller pedro whenever, and i are similar in that regard whenever i roll the joint i have i have a box of joints up here and right in the box of joints is a joint roller i cannot do it without i'm sorry i've tried everybody's like joint just, roller sit down, or I'll use just sit down and just do it just do it just do it i'm like yeah I, i'm done what's funny is i can't use a joint roller 
I, I them and they're good all over the fucking place. I'm like, ah, I'm so quick, dude. I can sit down and just roll ten of them, fucking <laughs> rip, rip, rip it up. Oh, it's so quick. But I, but I'm not a real big joint smoker. When I smoke joints, is when I'll <clears throat> when I'm going number one if I want to smoke flour for the ease of it and whatnot. Um, and sometimes I'll kind of flip back and forth just a little bit. Um, but when I'm going out and doing something, you know, the, the fishing. Um, not necessarily the hunting because hunting I like dabs because we're talking about smell. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah but, I, um, I like a joint if I'm in the boat. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. We used I'll to take a lot of those fit the boat cup holder. <laughs> we used to take we used to take uh, uh trips long before Puffco was ever even thought of. And uh we we would roll like one gallon baggies of of joints, you know, and just take a shitload of joints with us already pre-rolled and oh, we yeah. know that we've got nine fucking days <laughs> and there's four of us do the goddamn math right. did you do the sandwich <laughs> like one sandwich ziplock per day and then there was like you know nine of those and one no, gallon we ziplock we we like like job job. Them. Them. next time you come we up for girl we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, take, we'll take the razor out and you put your puff co in the cup holder <laughs> that sucker stays there I think I'll just hold on to it while you drive. Yeah, I'll exactly. feed you. I mean, I was I have that. taken I have taken a dab rig on some crazy fucking mountain four wheeling yeah, trails. You posted some photos on top of mountains from the four wheeler. Yeah, dab rig on a rock. Yep, exactly. <laughs> taking you know, and I'm not afraid. So I'll crazy. take a I'll take a fucking four thousand dollar rig out there just because just just because i want that picture on that rock <laughs> <laughs> we did take the dr dabber to the rockies with us that was the Thanks. easy one i'm a big fan of getting out of the nature and you know it's kind of funny because i always said back in the day i literally literally said that art has no place in humanity whatsoever there's no value to art in humanity i've been caught saying that and you know i it, it's been a complete Mr. gallery turnaround. owner over here <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's been a complete turnaround um and I, I don't know exactly what that switch was but that was what was kind of what we were getting at with your glass and with with what you consume and whatnot um i love the i love that part of the industry i um you know, it's it, it's funny because there's almost a – I don't want it to be a lost art. You know, like – like. Sure. I see – okay, I was just going to bring up vape pens because you brought up hunting. I was like, vape pens are really convenient for hunting. You know, um, just keep – you know, you got all this gear. Um, I crack a jar in the middle of the woods, and I'm like, oh, my God, they're going to come flying. This is convenient shoots. when hunting. You just take your rosin, you decarb it, 50-50, you know, and we're talking about medicine here, right? So there's multiple, multiple ways of consuming it. Who says that we're out on the trail and we're out when we're hunting and we're out that we have to be smoking it? Right, right. Or vaping, oh, or vaping it, yeah. You know, you always put I it in your body. Could always boof it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we could. <laughs> Yeah, the oil. But anyways, going back to the vaping and whatnot, you were you were saying. Well, well, what was I saying about that? I don't know. Um. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I was trying to keep up with Dad. <laughs> Excuse me. I think we're out now. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I like I like uh, I like dabs for very specific times i guess is what i'm saying they're very circumstantial um specifically if we're out and about or you know you need it to be a little less less stinky but i do like the flavor in the dabs for me i don't feel like i get more of an effect from dabs you know i don't know if that's a endocannabinoid system being saturated all the time type of a thing <clears throat> um i get a flavor thing i get an effect thing but I usually just smoke a joint after, and I don't know. I don't know if I even feel the joint either. Yeah, I was gonna say I think that's probably a little bit, um, prep, you know, preference, and you know, uh, dabbing is my ninety nine percent 
dab and then once in a while i'll, I'll smoke some flour you guys saw me smoking smoking a joint a couple days ago as a matter of fact um i will agree with you that and i've said it hundreds of times probably on podcasts and whatnot live when i go from my dabs when i go from smoking rosin to smoking a joint or smoking a bowl it's like whoa back up hang on hang on yeah. ask me this time you know because it gets me um but i do think that and i'm lucky to have a very large selection of different cannabinoids and terpenes in different strains of rosin so if i'm feeling like just burnt out i'll just switch jars you know that's the or, big thing or i'll consume yeah. and i consume you know different i'll consume obviously the same way by just swallowing it but i'll consume different methods of extraction of of cannabis as well yeah. i'm always medicated but I'm i heard absolutely is, always medicated I, i've heard that you're not <clears throat> you're not building a tolerance to specifically thc you're building a tolerance to a, a profile <clears throat> that's a yeah good, yeah totally it's including yeah. terpenes and everything else in there and if you can just switch up that profile you know your tolerance in a sense resets you know you, you might you might not need the thc but you might be getting some other stuff that you weren't getting it's gonna change the entourage effect ever so slightly I love just I love like you were saying the the full spectrum. So that that jar that you that you saw there is just a bunch of different food. It's unfortunately it's food grade. It, it's it's some what of, of, of 73 to 159. For the most part, it's 45 to 70, 72 micron, but it's not one specific cultivar in there. Is there's it's it's a little bit it's a little bit um runny is that it's like, it's 50 alcohol, 50, it 50, 50 it was decarb number one and then it's 50 50 coconut oil so coconut oil okay yep 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 and that's just why um i've i've found that and maybe it's just me but i find found that if i take a a gram of even rso or a gram of that uh without the coconut oil and then i take a uh, a gram you know but 50 percent coconut oil 50 percent rosin i will get much higher with the mix and that's obviously because of the bonding agent yeah know? yeah yeah but it's just a way of you know you can go to the you can go to dispensaries here in colorado and you can get everybody gets a gram of rso you know and then they they try to just take a little piece of it and rub it on their gums and i'm like man why don't you just get some get a cook some coconut oil <clears throat> Right. some coconut oil warm that shit up stir it up and then you've got a bunch of it you know you can put it on a pill you can you can start baking with it you know i mean there's yeah. there's lots of different ways of consumption that we can talk about besides just smoking it it's a lot easier to dose for people who like like you know the people who are like well i took some of that rso and i don't think i want to take it anymore <laughs> <laughs> But like some people like like a half a grain of rice is still too much, and it's like oh yeah, you absolutely. Piece it down into a carrier, and 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 then you know low dose it because you're yeah, it's it's potent stuff. I yeah, just I, talked to someone that found out recently that their dose was two point five milligrams. Oh well, and, well and see, I I would much rather you oh. mix, you know, uh, dilute it as much as possible, and then have to take five or ten caps than i would to have you get overly fucked up the first oh, time for sure for, for sure, sure. Yeah. you know it yeah. just that, I, I i really get scared when we start talking about concentrates and first timers you know there's that there is always that little bit of a giggle you know like ha, ah, you know it's gonna fuck them up you know but but in in reality if it's a first timer and and you're going in on a on a dose that's highly not recommended and given <laughs> to like somebody that's uneducated man it can be a really bad experience and then you've just turned that person off to to cannabis and then who are they turning off then i mean you kind of start a little bit of a ripple effect you know? so being, ed being educated and being responsible about it you know it's part of our responsibility i guess i agree i've always wanted to you just 
make allow people to enjoy it. You, you know, I think that there's so much, there's been so much uh, misinformation, not just misinformation, but just bad information. And, you know, people have bad experiences for other reasons too, just bad weed. <clears throat> and I don't mean, I don't mean poorly grown weed, but like, what was the, what was the shit back in the day with the paraquat in it? I mean, that could have had some effects on people. There most certainly was, you know, and I'm not talking about propaganda. Like there was certainly a time frame where PCP was a very popular additive for a lot of things, including boofer. I mean, boofer sticks were popular. That was a thing. Boofer sticks were a thing. I bring up the PCP and weed thing, and, and, and a lot of people think that that is like a propaganda through the news thing. But no, like there were there was a lot of PCP in weed. It wasn't like like was people people were putting PCP in their own weed. It wasn't like they were dosing. They were putting it in their own weed. And so it was like dipping cigarettes in ether, like that type of a thing. And so oh, okay. people would smoke weed and get freaked the fuck out, you know? And, and, and I, I mean, I ever saw right, you know, one of the experiences that I had smoking weed specifically in Florida with my cousin, I've never been so fucking high in my life, man, ever, ever, ever. And I've always been trying to find a strain of weed that would get me that high. And it had to have been some shit in that weed. There's, I've never gotten there. You know what I mean? Tried a whole. I've been smoking, growing, fine, nothing. You know what I mean? And 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 it was something in that weed that it was much more different. And it was just apparently, so apparently something you liked. Just so happened. <laughs> I, I did at least. So just so happened to be that same time frame. You know, same area. You know that. You know, Tampa area. You know, there's just there's that was a high PCP. Uh, uh, I don't know what it was infestation yeah flood or whatever you know whatever was going on there at the time you know is you know whatever was going on and but anyways 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 people get that dose and it freaks them out mm. that's weed <clears throat> that wasn't weed that was somebody's shitty version of you know a sure. drug you know whatever and and nowadays you have <clears throat> not in the legal state when before michigan was legal the you know, what was it? Is it K two and the synthetic weed shit? That stuff was pretty spice. popular. Spice, yeah, spice and all that stuff. I was addicted to that shit one time. Were you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so. in, in, in a lot horribly, of it, actually horribly. They're, they're research chemicals. It's just sprayed on like potpourri or sprayed mm -hmm. on, on, on mint or whatever the mm -hmm. fuck they want to spray a water. To this, to this day, that water, little that know? little blue fucking flower. What is it? That little that they put in potpourri. It's a little or purple. Oh, wow flower it's uh oh, i can't think of what the hell the name of it is but i can't stand it. is it lavender no the little lavender I yeah but I, the, the potpourri and stuff i just can't really stand the smell of it because it just gets me that yeah i was i was i was trying to smoke i was trying to get a job um back in wisconsin i could i couldn't tell you where now but i was trying to get a job uh actually it may have been the job that eventually got me into colorado um but I, I started smoking this instead of instead of cannabis because you couldn't test for it. Got you about the same high, you know. Right. And and then uh, <laughs> they started outlawing the chemical, so they change it, and then they start selling, it, and then they outlaw all that chemical, and they started changing, it, you know. And by the time, you know, fifteenth, twentieth generation of them, you know, getting around the legality of it, um, it was really bad stuff. And, um, and yeah, I was, I eventually got highly addicted to it, actually. Um, I remember then, hearing, we're, we're seeing on the news quite a few stories of like teenagers or whatever, like going through psychosis or, you know, psychotic mm -hmm. episodes and having to, you know, get jailed overnight for one reason or another. There was, uh, there was a, a, a large population of people that were using it specifically because they're, their jobs either did drug mm -hmm. tests or something and and it was Absolutely. it was their way of avoiding because because the marketing behind those research chemicals was that it was a cannabis analog or something yeah or cannabis analogs I yeah, think. i'll tell you yeah at yeah. when i first started smoking it it was very similar like similar. very similar yeah. Yeah. And then afterwards, it was not. And, and what I believe is <laughs> only a THC analog. So I think <laughs> it would be more similar to doing like diamonds and only smoking diamonds, even though you think you're like smoking a bowl. You know what I mean? Like it's more like less like flour and more like 
just raw THC crystal or something like that. Mm. <clears throat> but again, an analog and probably still nothing right. identical to the... And all because they want to fucking outlaw this goddamn natural right. plant. Right. And that's... What if a carrot got you high? <laughs> well, okay. Aren't they doing that with fungi as well right now? I, You know, isn't there something going on with the mushroom industry in which, like, research chemicals are being used instead of mushrooms inside of like you know chocolate bars or other products have you guys read about this at all oh i absolutely believe that 100 dude that's why i don't trust mushroom bars so i got into the safe space of of re harm reduction because 15 years ago i got this hair over here that's funny. 15 years ago i took two hits of blotter acid and it wasn't blotter acid it was or it wasn't lsd it was I don't know what the fuck it was, but it was something that spun me for for a, a trip that made me never want to touch the shit ever again. And 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 that was one of the LSD was one of those things that like changed my perspective on how I wanted to go, you know, um, be an entrepreneur. It changed a lot of things about my personality and in a lot of better ways. It changed my social ability. It changed um, a lot of ways I perceive things and in a lot of ways. And I actually helped me like get through a lot of uh, traumas and, and made me just feel better. Um, I did most certainly consider it a therapy and whatever the fuck this stuff was uh, spun me for a loop. But anyway, I went and looked into some information about what was going around at the time and 25I NBOME, if it's bitter, it's a spitter. Uh, was going around and they were there were actually people dying from this stuff uh, again research chemical that was just is being passed off as lsd it can fit on a blotter paper it's nothing like lsd it doesn't have the same safety profile as it you you know you could have a tolerance to lsd and take 10 doses to try to get high and it's not going to kill you with this stuff if you tried to take 10 doses it would kill you so if you thought that it was lsd and you accidentally took 10 strip people take 10 strips of lsd all the time if you took a 10 strip it would kill you i think like five to seven would be a lethal dose so and 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 so uh, there are cases of people dying on 25 im bome um of, of a direct result of the substance not of you know getting into a car accident or something but there's there's also uh you know just again i talked about my cousin earlier getting uh poisonous mushrooms instead of psilocybin mushrooms today that's a little bit easier to you, you know um test you, you, well you can test and that's that's that these are the important things about it is within the last you know decade or re, uh testing reagents have become available for all those substances so you can test your mushroom bar for psilocybin you can test it for mainly you can test it for also adulterants um that's a big thing now because research chemical analogs change all the time they're coming out with new chemical compounds they don't have test reagents for everything but a lot of like the big ones fentanyl uh that's a big one you might want to look for um and and maybe even to make sure that you don't just have some uh, 2ci or 25i or any of these other ones that are much cheaper to source through, you know, other countries or wherever you're going to get them on the dark web. They're cheaper. Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about if we're talking about mushrooms and fungi, I mean, there's so much easier ways to consume, including so much, gr yeah. growing your own. And oh, I mean, yeah, ridiculously own. easy. So plug much my, easier. Plug my buddy right. fucking Tanazi, uh, yeah. sacred sacred three mushrooms, man. He's up in Denver, and he'll he sends out kits that all you have to do is inject. He's already got everything already done. It's already all sanitized and whatnot. You just pull it out, pull the syringe, inject it. A couple, I don't know, weeks, months later, you've got you've got mushrooms out your ass. I mean, hopefully not legally. Hopefully not actually. Literally, yeah. yeah. Fruit. You can actually see the fruit. It's just so much safer. And you might have missed the injection. Yeah, you missed it. Right? You, yep, it was not. It was not very sanitized at that point. <laughs> the uh, the fact that you don't know what could be on blotter paper or in a mushroom or or not in a mushroom in a in a chocolate bar or a 
a beverage, you know what I mean? Uh, a lot of times pill pills, you know, pills are a hugely common one. Uh, MDMA is most commonly um, meth methadrone, which is an analog of MDMA. Um, it's also an analog of methamphetamine. Uh, it's also legal, you know, and they ship it and whatever, and it's it's a stimulant. Uh, amphetamine, you can just get raw amphetamine products, you know, uh, stackers. People fucking empty out stackers and replace them, you know, give you stackers for ecstasy. You're not going to know the difference, you know. Um, a lot of that stuff, it reacts the same on your, on your serotonin system, your dopamine system. Uh, big difference is dosage, you know, the more dosage, lighter dosage. Some of them have ever so, but I mean, grow mushrooms, you know, yeah, grow your mushrooms with Peter said, Tanasi, and you don't know what's in any of this shit. That's the thing. It's Do it you can get testing reagents. Unfortunately, testing reagents were criminalized. Uh, they are considered paraphernalia. So uh, he who created the paraphernalia laws <clears throat> in office uh, um, is to blame for test kits. You know, you can't even test your drugs for fentanyl because it's le illegal to carry them. You know, you can so well get them though. Bunkpolice.com sells them, dancesafe.com sells them. So you can dance safe. Gotta access remember dance safe them. back yep. in the day. Holy you can access test kits. Uh, but yeah, I mean, even for the 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 person that's wanting to start up their first grow or whatnot, you know, think about it realistically. If if you're wanting to start up your first grow you're not a big consumer you don't smoke a lot of cannabis right i would assume you don't smoke a ton of cannabis i mean so, it, it got to the point for me where it was just expensive enough it's like why am i not just so, doing this so. exactly so that's and that's what i'm getting at you know so you can you can do a three by three or four by four and you know for sure the first grow is going to cost you more than you could have probably bought that cannabis if probably, you do yeah. right. <laughs> the, that's the unfortunate part but on the plus side, you've just grown your own cannabis. You've learned a lot. You've started to become, you know, um, self-sufficient. Um, and then and then every grow from there on out, um, technically the flower becomes cheaper and cheaper and cheaper because you've already done paid for your, your investment initially. Um, and then, yeah, so just knowing... Knowing what goes into your cannabis, knowing what goes into your all of your food, you know... Um, doing your your own permaculture and whatnot is 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 an amazing way to go about it um and yeah man of just any way that you can be more self-sufficient in the things that you consume overall um is is obviously the i would i would say for me as a goal you know dude what once i found out that <laughs> that our food supply is just as corrupt as our drug supply or mm. just as tainted as our drug supply. That's why. Yeah. Food I drug administration. What food and what in the yeah. same sentence? Yeah. I administration and food in the same sentence, food and drug. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> now all of a sudden it's like ding, ding, ding. Oh yeah. shit. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Uh, um, it, I know. Yeah, that right. almost Miller case is going <laughs> on right now. You know, the the right to the right to have a subscription model CSA or is is at you know that is at risk right now. You know, subscription model farming is at is at risk right now. The the almost Miller farm was they got too large. They were too large for that model. So, you know, they they want them to conventionalize and and they don't believe that they need to, and neither do their customers is the thing. Now, if your customers are screaming, you know, they need regulation. That's one thing, but they're not. You know, it's it's just the agency that is. Um, Amos Miller, they're a, a Amish. I believe cattle farm is is the primary source of, of their of their farm, but they they run a they run a non USDA model that operates off of subscription base. Now you can't sell meat, but you can sell the live animal and you can also sell a share of your farm. So there's many ways that farmers, small farms throughout the country, throughout the world, probably depending on, on where you are in the world, but 
definitely in this country in America where they uh farmers are able to conduct business through yeah you know, sounds we, like we subscribe to a csa up here subscriptions like you you sell yeah. me the pig and then i will you can pay me to then kill it and butcher it for you and yeah, then well, we get, we get a lot of supplemental <laughs> veggies and everything plus meat all from the same place it's great no nope. one flat rate for the year and Boom. Pay me this butcher consultation fee, and I'll gift you the yeah, two hundred yeah. pounds of pork. There you go. <laughs> and so, a lot of a lot of farmers operate on these on models very similar. And if if you want to look into those type of things, Joel Salatin, he has a pretty cool book that's interesting called "Everything I Want to Do Is Illegal." Um, and there's a couple other books by Joel Salatin that just do discuss, you know, ways of different farming methods uh is really popular for his book pasture poultry profits uh right. in that book specifically he'll teach you how to work your you know some models to sell meat specifically uh because he doesn't have any fda license he's a very large farm um the the fact that 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 our food is so i don't know just stepped on in so many in lack of better sense of phrasing there's so much uh, added ingredients that aren't necessary um may, maybe for shelf preservation or maybe for some other things um growing your own i'm just an advocate of, of doing it yourself and, and yes for sustainability reasons but i mean for us you know medical reasons just health reasons just general uh again you know making sure the supply chain doesn't anti-fragility reasons you know just a lot of that is is that and that's right i really enjoy permaculture organic growing uh our outdoor garden never really got into that is is all organic uh i don't like putting any chemicals i don't spray any come i don't want to take the balance off i want to do everything as natural as possible mm -hmm. outside our yeah. indoor garden i'm already disconnected from the sun uh we're growing under electric light expensive electric light still but nonetheless, we're not grounded in any means, so we're still kind of running hydroponics. Now, we do not waste water out the bottom of our hydro with three minutes left to your show. Uh, so we, we try to consume all of our minerals and then smoke it in our plants. And then the waste, root balls, those get composted. So, Bro, sell that shit and bring that it organics indoor. I'm telling you. We do plan, we do plan to bring our organics indoor. Um, we don't know how long it's going to take to get through this jacks. We 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 again we don't want to get you know maybe we try to sell some of it or whatever. But then there's more cost in getting into it. Yeah, so. you could you could get a couple of LED lights for some of those bags. Yeah, I've right. had to, you know, give it enough time. Probably, probably give it enough time. I'm hoping the value of those jacks bags will go up. That's why I bought so many. I was like, somebody's going to need some of this. Going to yeah, be me and us. Yeah, cash <laughs> some of it away for the future. And need it on Mars. But, uh, I really appreciate you guys letting yeah, me come yeah. on and chat away, man. It's been a lot of fun being on here with you guys. Of course, Rod. It's, Cheers, it's, it's been a pleasure, great having man. you on. Yeah, here I, we I, are. Here we are at the end, man. You wanna you wanna throw some plugs out there? Yeah. Well, Becca, fire yourself up. I, I definitely want to shout out Becca. Do you want to come say hi real fast? No, she doesn't want to say hi real fast. Uh -huh. It's all right. We saw her enough. She was walking. Yeah, Michigan Bros. Grow Show. She was back here walking around. She's 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 my better half uh daddy red for sure the michigan bros grow show mama red she's up with you probably listening um and where can everybody find you you can find me on on instagram mostly at red setter farm uh also at rosemary's oasis becca primarily takes care of that account but that's going to be our our food our food you know system type thing and actually we might uh, over umbrella the whole red setter farm thing with the rosemary's oasis and make red setter farm a portion of that so and they've got chickens and it, it, it i i mean yeah i really wish we could have gotten to that garden more to the the backyard gardening stuff maybe we'll come back on as rosemary's oasis next time there you go we can get into all of that stuff because that's a whole nother you know, talking about permaculture, dude. I could mm -hmm. talk for another two hours just on that. So it was just really cool, like walking past uh, this wall of sunflowers, and then into you know maybe by the uh, you know a half dozen chickens, and then through just this 
beautifully laid out and uh, I'll call it manicured. You might not call it manicured, but just beautiful manicured backyard garden with dozens of different fruits and vegetables and flowers and cannabis mixed into it. And it was, it's really cool the way you had that going. Thanks, uh, I, I'd love to talk more about that again. Maybe, maybe as rosemary's, rosemary's, oh, rosemary's oh i can't get it i can't get it yeah dude yeah try, you know try to dump it i already started the show with it you know aka i can't pronounce it so we'll just leave it there <laughs> find him on instagram and with us sometime and yeah. uh i i really thank everybody in chat and for everybody tuning in and for you guys most certainly for having me on and thanks for all the kind words man i really appreciate it you guys are of course very nice. yeah just keep growing those great I can't wait to, to smoke and sesh with you guys and especially you uh superior and pedro hopefully we get a chance to sesh yeah. in person soon sure. i'll be downstate at some point we cross the yeah. bridge every now and then every every <laughs> few years he comes yeah. south of the wall you know but hey guys cheers uh make sure you f- uh, find us after the show on spotify everywhere you find your podcast we've got a great lineup of guests coming here over the next few weeks so stay tuned and cheers take care everybody Have a great one.